Hello, everyone. Good morning to the second day of the Eden Annual Conference. I hope you can hear me well. We are still getting uh, our participants into the room. So, um, so good morning to everyone on the second day of the Eden Annual Conference 2021, hosted by UNED this year. We have quite a busy, interesting uh, day with a number of uh, uh, activities uh, from keynotes, uh, presentations, workshops, uh, Eden Fellows, everything uh, was there. I'm certain that you were really tired at the end of the day, but uh, I think that the, the uh, like sweet uh, uh, at the end of the day, we have the Madrid virtual tour. Uh, who, which was prepared by Beatriz Sedano, and this was really something special. You can feel the breath of Madrid uh, uh, while you were watching uh, uh, this virtual tour. So I strongly recommend uh, to watch the recording in and get some glimpse of uh, uh, Madrid. Uh, you will feel like you were there. Okay. So uh, let's start with another day. We have a number of uh, interesting sessions uh, today as well. And uh, I'm certain that each of you will find something uh, which was uh, very interesting to you. Uh, today, uh, we start with the two, uh, with the plenary, with two uh, uh, keynotes. Uh, I'm very happy uh, that they are uh, with us today, and I'm very happy to uh, announce uh, my keynotes today, uh, Georgi Dimitrov, um, Acting Head of Unit of Digital Education from European Commission, and uh, Manuel Castro, Professor of Electro Electrical and Computer Engineering uh, from UNED. Uh, we will have uh, very interesting insights uh, related to education uh, from the European Commission perspective and maybe from engineering perspective, but I'm certain that you will uh, enjoy the session and uh, we are open for your questions, which you can uh, put in the chat. So uh, not to take too long uh, to enable my uh, keynotes to have enough time for, for their uh, uh, presentations. I would like to start first with Georgi, who joined the European Commission in 2008, and between 2009 and 2013, he was involved in various roles in set up, setting up European Institute of Innovation and Technology. And after that, he managed uh, the launch of High Education Innovate, an initiative uh, by European Commission and OECD that supports entrepreneurial and innovative universities. He then acquired experience as a policy advisor to senior management, and in January 2017, Georgi assumed the role of deputy head of unit of innovation and European Institute of Innovation and Technology in DGAC, where he was responsible for uh, eight digital education and innovation and education, including business university cooperation. In January 2021, he became head of digital education. And you might remember him from the, our last uh, annual conference, but as well from the autumn when in the one of the webinars within our series online together, he presented digital education action plan. So I'm very happy to have you with us, Georgi, today. You're going to talk about digital education from European Union digital decade. I'm certain that we are all eager to hear what are the further actions from European Commission regarding the digital education action plan and the activities which can help us to become more resilient and answer to the challenges we are facing. So, Georgi, floor is yours. Good morning, uh, Sandra and um, good morning to everyone in the audience. Um, I would like to thank you, first of all, for the invitation to come again to Eden. Um, it's not self-explanatory and it's an honor for me to be here. Um, looking back at uh, your organization, which uh, is now 30, so it's pretty young, um, but very experienced. Um, I have to say that um, 
uh, one senses a certain uh, humility um, uh, because of the experience that you have accumulated with um, uh, all these three decades, as it were, of experience. And of course, the power of the community that uh, you have uh, by now, um, let's say, built is something that um, always makes me, uh, let's say, rather humble uh, when, when I speak to, to, to people like you who have much more experience than, than, uh, than me. Uh, but I hope that I can contribute to the discussion uh, today from the European perspective. Um, and I want to thank um, uh, you, Sandra. I want to thank uh, Andras, the Secretary General. But I want to thank also Irina, the previous president, for a good cooperation in the last few years since I got involved more and more in this, um, in this field. Uh, you have presented uh, uh, my experience. Um, and um, I uh, would say that um, every year um, is in a way different. Um, every year has its challenges and uh, uh, specificities. Uh, and um, I think uh, this last year is, uh, is not an exception, uh, certainly, but it is rather special in, in a lot of uh, senses. And I think you would agree with me being the European distance and e-learning um, sort of network uh, that um, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's time to draw some lessons, so your title today is really, really uh, appropriate. I will try to, to draw some lessons, but I would also uh, look uh, forward and um, uh, give you a couple of uh, really operational uh, points um, in the second part of my presentation, plus uh, a short um, but important announcement. And um, I want to also, uh, before I put uh, a few uh, slides on, I want to uh, recognize your activities, um, uh, in particular since the pandemic. The title of the conference is Lessons from a Pandemic uh, for the Future of Education. I want to, to really recognize your activities uh, because um, I have um, observed the uh, energy, the um, focus, and also the really the... Um, uh, the, the, the goodwill of, of the knowledge sharing that you have been um, uh, really, really uh, accelerating over the last year. And I, uh, I, I certainly believe that the community appreciates this very much. I, I do. And uh, I think this is the, the way forward, in fact, if we want to, to achieve um, our objectives around the uh, future of education. So let me um, share now um, my screen uh, here and um, go directly into the presentation. So I would like to talk about digital education for EU's digital decade. And um, uh, the digital decade, in fact, is um, the current one, the one that just started. Um, the European Commission has um, um, proposed, let's say, this title in um, the digital uh, decade communication, which came a few uh, months ago. And uh, I would like to place the discussion of digital education in the EU's digital decade. Now, it is always uh, appropriate to start with the, the basic facts, um, because um, I know that you probably know them, but um, it is worth recalling that um, when it comes to education and training, it is the responsibility of the member states to um, um, let's say, uh, organize uh, their education and training systems. Uh, they are responsible for the content, uh, the curricula, etc. And um, this is following the famous subsidiarity principle, uh, which comes from the Catholic um, uh, theory, and uh, which is basically saying that whatever can be solved at the local level should be solved at the local level. Now, you will um, know, of course, that, um, for example, in many member states, uh, education is even a regional matter. For example, today's host, UNED, in Madrid, is a, is a nice example. Uh, Spain has uh, um, this structure with a regional responsibility also for education. So um, the more you go into the detail, the more complicated it gets. However, I hope you would agree with one thing, that um, in a digital world, local, regional, national, European, or even global, are perhaps not the best adjectives to describe the nature of uh, digital education. They are helpful, but perhaps not fully sufficient by now. And um, I think this is why you have seen the European Union acting in um, the field of e-learning, uh, as it was called 
um, then uh, open education uh, and digital education for quite some time now. Um, 20 years ago, the, the commission adopted the e-learning action plan plus its program. So um, we are supporting this field and we are now increasingly doing so because of the transversal and I would say accelerating nature of the digital transformation. So uh, to come to the, um, uh, one of the key topics uh, of, the, of the conference, um, the um, crisis um, brought a real disruption, not, uh, not um, a metaphorical one and uh, not one born in uh, some sort of uh, hype, but a real disruption uh, for uh, basically the entire world. And we have seen um, very uh, sudden and very um, significant shift to distance and online learning. And uh, this is data from UNESCO that I'm using here, uh, which essentially I, I think you would all be familiar with, but it's still worth recalling that uh, 1.6 billion learners in more than 190 countries were uh, basically excluded from, uh, from education. And in Europe, um, around 100 um, uh, million uh, learners were actually among those. Then globally, uh, 100 million learning staff were impacted by the closure of the institutions. And um, this has been a rather unprecedented um, situation and one that uh, definitely calls for um, learning. Um, what we have seen is a lot of uh, good and innovative practice, um, but we have seen some systemic uh, deficiencies and systemic gaps uh, related not only to, um, let's say, the levels of technological uh, advancement, etc., but uh, really um, uh, about uh, equity, uh, about uh, inequality, and also the quality of, of uh, education as well. So um, this is um, the situation in Europe as it stand, uh, stand uh, as it as, as it was in in April. What you see here uh, on this uh, picture is uh, effectively the whole Europe uh, uh, having closed its um, uh, schools and uh, higher education institutions, with some very small exceptions here, at least from this snapshot in April, and. Um, this was also um, the time when, um, uh, of course, everyone went back to work also from home. And um, if you allow me just uh, maybe a simplistic um, uh, analogy here, uh, we have seen people going back to, to, uh, to their homes and we have seen remote working. Um, we have seen huge institutions um, completely reverting to, to uh, remote working. Um, I will not name uh, institutions here, but I have seen very big institutions who have managed to do that. And um, it worked somehow. Um, I think when it comes to uh, the distance learning that we uh, had to also, um, also introduce in a way everywhere, the story was much more of a hit and miss and the, the, the differences are significant among the member states, but uh, we have observed some, uh, let's say, systemic and underlying uh, challenges. And um, as it happens sometimes in life, um, when this happened, we were just about um, developing the new digital education action plan, which I will come uh, to in, in, uh, in a couple of slides. Uh, so we were starting to work on it. And then suddenly, um, 13th of March, um, on a Friday, we were told, okay, so uh, we go home and so then uh, everything closes. Um, so it was very clear for us that um, such an experiment in education cannot um, uh, be left uh, without a very, very uh, thorough examination, let's call it like this. So we have launched what we call in, in, uh, in the European Commission, an open public consultation, what, uh, which is um, normally accompanying every major uh, policy initiative. It is part of the better regulation uh, toolkit. Uh, we normally do this whenever we develop new uh, proposals. So we have um, organized an open public consultation, which um, uh, we launched in June, and then we closed in September. 
And this open public consultation was uh, really interesting from a number of, um, of, of points. Um, not only was um, it quite popular in, uh, let's say, um, uh, comparative terms to what we have run before, uh, it was actually uh, very, very popular uh, with the number of the different contributions that it uh, attracted, but also um, uh, a lot of position papers from different organizations. Um, but not only the quantity was significant, um, the diversity uh, of the um, respondents' uh, cohort was also very, very interesting because we have seen uh, not only the education and training stakeholders, as it were um, our traditional stakeholders, participating actively, but we have seen uh, much more than that. We have seen uh, a lot from the private sector, um, from civil society, and very, very tellingly, uh, a lot also of um, citizens and in their capacity, of course, of uh, parents quite often, uh, but also learner or researcher. So this level of interest from um, many, many countries um, essentially told us that um, there is something quite uh, significant um, uh, going on. And uh, I would like to share with you some of the main findings of this uh, open public consultation. Um, they are not meant to be uh, statistically uh, representative, um, but um, uh, we uh, still use some of the numbers that I will quote now uh, for, uh, for presentational purposes. Of course, this is not uh, um, uh, peer-reviewed research, uh, but it is, um, it is based on the data that we have received. And uh, the, um, uh, the picture that we have uh, seen is uh, made of uh, light and shade, as it were, for around 60% of the respondents, the COVID crisis has led to the very first experience with distance and online learning. And um, one needs to recognize that this is probably already accounting for a self-selection bias of those interested in digital education because there would be those that are uh, also going to be filling out uh, such a uh, open public consultation. So 60% um, experiencing very first time distance and uh, online learning. Very, very tellingly, for a huge majority of around 90% uh, of the respondents, this uh, crisis already back in the summer last year, um, so almost a year ago, I would say, was a turning point for the use of technology in education. Um, and these are quite powerful messages uh, for uh, policymakers, uh, and especially those who are working on um, fields which are not necessarily always at the center of, of, uh, of um, um, policy making. And we have, um, we have then asked um, uh, what are then the, the, the top challenges uh, when it comes to this um, uh, shift or to this turn to, to um, online and distance learning. And um, uh, we have seen at the top, really, um, the issue of socioeconomic uh, inequalities with around uh, close to 50% of um, the respondents, um, which essentially is saying that um, this situation increases the um, uh, socioeconomic inequalities between learners that, of course, are already there uh, for those that come from um, better placed families uh, and those who do not have that chance. And um, we have um, also seen that um, this is very much uh, related to insufficient infrastructure, internet connectivity, and equipment. So as you know, across uh, Europe, there have been very significant efforts and quite successful ones among them to uh, bridge that gap uh, over, the, uh, over the couple of months that we, uh, that we had the uh, schools and uh, um, universities to a lesser extent completely closed. Uh, but um, we have probably um, underestimated the um, uh, issues around access to infrastructure, connectivity, and equipment. Uh, so it might well be that we have been carried um, away by, by other things uh, before COVID hit. Uh, so it was uh, quite, uh, quite an interesting uh, lesson to see that actually happening. Um, Around 40% um, um, mentioned the lack of teacher training and guidance as a very significant challenge when we talk about the transition to um, an online mode of learning. But 
uh, almost equally, the number um, uh, of around 40 have um, said that um, what is also very important is to have a plan to integrate this type of technology. So what we would refer more as uh, organizational capacity, if you like. And uh, last but not least, I'll come back to this a bit later, the question of um, high quality online learning content, uh, which was either not there or was not um, findable uh, or was not appropriate. And I will say a few words about it um, later. But um, in a nutshell, the two most essential elements uh, that the respondents uh, seemed to agree around is one, teachers having, uh, teachers and educators having relevant digital skills, and second, the necessity to have an organizational vision and strategy. Um, not surprisingly, um, digital skills and competences were considered uh, to be even more important um, and um, maybe uh, we will see a boost through, through COVID in the levels of digital skills and competences. But I would like to um, now go into the question also of the um, uh, digital skills and competences at the European level, because they are among the most um, important targets that we have set ourselves um, to um, when it comes to the digital transformation of education and skills. So what, what you see here um, is the um, continuing long-term challenge around uh, digital skills attainment in Europe. This data comes from 2019, Eurostat, and uh, essentially um, compares the um, member states um, with their relative attainment of uh, what we call basic digital skills. And um, it is uh, important to mention here that the EU has set itself a target to reach 80% of the population um, with uh, at least the basic digital skills or above basic by 2030. This is in the digital compass. And equally important um, is the target to reach uh, 20 million. Apologies for, uh, on the right-hand side, there is a, a couple of letters missing next to the 20. It should be called million. Um, 20 million uh, ICT specialists. These are long-standing policies of the European Commission. They have been um, updated recently through the skills agenda and most recently through the digital compass. But the point that I would like to make here is that um, of course, we see here probably that some countries are further from the target and others are, are more close to, to, the, to it. And that's all fair. Um, uh, and these are absolute numbers which probably do not say that much. But if one would take the um, comparative um, data from 2015 and would apply the growth rate between uh, the years and would project this growth rate into the future, uh, then one has to say first that the growth rate uh, from 15, 2015 to 2019 um, was effectively only 2%. So basically we have gone from 54 to 56% of the individuals aged 16 to 74, which have at least basic digital skills. And I don't think that we need to be... Um, um, uh, having a lot of advanced mathematical skills to know that with a growth rate of 2% uh, over four years um, and an underlying, um, let's say, uh, compound of, uh, well, a little bit, uh, on top of that, we would never reach the targets of, uh, on, um, for 2030. And um, it is important to say that uh, this is not only valid for the basic digital skills, uh, this is valid also for the... Um, advanced digital skills that we have set ourselves targets for. Uh, we would have countries um, essentially that need to quadruple uh, their um, overall base of uh, ICT professionals, engineers, etc., in order to achieve those targets. So we know that the digital transformation in the meantime is um, going really, really fast. So we may be either too ambitious with the targets or we may need to do something um, uh, a, a little bit differently. And <clears throat> I would like to come now to the question of what we, um, what we would be um, uh, doing also with the new digital education action plan. And I would really like to put it 
in the bigger context. So um, the action plan um, that I'll say also a few words on is um, really positioned in a larger context. And this is very, very important uh, to, to stress. If we take um, those boxes and we work them um, from uh, the left-hand side clockwise, then first of all, let me mention that uh, we have a um, executive vice president of the European Commission now who is responsible for a Europe fit for the digital age, uh, Ms. Uh, Margarete Vestager. Uh, she's uh, overseeing different digital uh, transformation um, policies and work streams at the commission level. And this now includes the Digital Education Action Plan as well. And of course, we have our commissioner, Maria Gabriel, who is a huge champion of the Digital Education Action Plan. Then, um, right, um, uh, we are um, uh, updating our ambitions on the European education area. And we have uh, proposed uh, to achieve a European education area by 2025. Um, it is fair to say that even with limited competences in the field of education, cooperation in education in Europe is a success story. And um, uh, one needs to look at uh, only at, uh, or uh, to say only Erasmus, but it is so much more than this. And we believe that uh, digital education can be one of the key enablers for the continuation of this successful cooperation in education in Europe. Then uh, to the right, we have uh, just um, a few months ago, um, an over we have presented an overhaul of the um, strategic objectives of the, of the um, uh, commission when it comes to the digital transformation. We have presented them in the digital compass. They uh, um, essentially include a variety of policies that are affected by um, the uh, digital transformation. And we are also um, uh, having targets there related to the skills, I have already mentioned them, but we have also um, a very important reference to universal digital education. And last but not least um, is, of course, the next generation EU, um, which is an unprecedented um, initiative, or um, uh, rather it is much more than an initiative um, of the Commission to support the member states um, out of the recover, out of the uh, crisis into the recovery and in order to uh, develop their resilience. The um, next generation package is better known as resilience and uh, recovery plans. And um, let me mention a few words about this because it is so important to um, learn from the momentum uh, since uh, all of this is happening uh, as we speak. Member states as um, um, as you probably know, are preparing recovery and uh, resilience plans and submitting them to the European Commission. Uh, the European Commission is right now um, in the process of approving those. We have been busy um, uh, working together with the member states in the last uh, around about six months on these plans. And um, now you can see the Commission effectively approving them one by one. For example, yesterday it was announced that the German um, uh, RRP has been, has been approved. And um, what we see there, and I cannot disclose data yet because the process is still ongoing, but um, I, uh, in my capacity, uh, have um, access to the different uh, resilience and recovery plans of all the member states. And what we see is very clear. Um, there is a trend towards recognizing digital education as a strategic priority. In fact, um, I would go so far as to say that this is the top priority when it comes to investment in um, education. Out of the different pots that one could invest uh, in education, this is where um, many member states uh, really put the, the emphasis on. Some indeed do um, emphasize only digital education. And um, what is, however, very uh, important and necessary is that um, while we are very happy to see this level of um, increased investment and focus, it is also quite important to accompany investment with reform, because um, reform uh, is sometimes necessary in order to achieve uh, some of the objectives that uh, we have set um, ourselves in uh, the field of digital education, but also in other policies as well. So uh, on the right hand side, you are essentially seeing just the top five investment areas when it comes to, to education, 
Uh, it's just for illustration infrastructure equipment, but also the, the skills, teacher training, and uh, the development of platforms. With this, um, um, I can uh, introduce uh, the Digital Education Action Plan very briefly that we have adopted in um, September last year. And uh, I would like to say um, just a few words um, on its key features. Uh, first of all, uh, we have set ourselves two long-term strategic objectives that we intend to follow through on over the entire multi-annual period. One is the need to develop a high-performing digital education ecosystem, which uh, includes the questions that I have mentioned on infrastructure, connectivity, equipment, but also content, tools, and platforms. And on the other hand, this is really uh, um, the ongoing priority uh, to continue to enhance digital skills and competences for the entire population, not only for those that are informal, but also through lifelong learning, adult learning, etc. We have proposed a longer duration of this action plan um, as opposed to the last one that we have, um, um, let's say, piloted only for, for a few years. Uh, why? Because we would like to align it with the programming cycle of the European Union, uh, which is a seven-year cycle, and this is necessary in order to increase the type of synergies that we want to see between the different programs, such as Erasmus, uh, but also uh, Horizon Europe or Digital Europe. And very importantly, of course, what I just uh, described a bit more, the resilience and the recovery plans. Very, very key is to um, look into the modernization of digital education um, in a cross-sectoral fashion. Um, why? Because there are plenty of uh, examples which are perhaps relevant for the different sectors of education, but there is also um, many that cut across um, uh, higher or lifelong learning, and uh, it is important to look beyond the sectors and try to, uh, to, to um, share their more knowledge and develop some practices. And equally important is a whole government approach. Let me just mention that uh, problems such as infrastructure um, probably cannot be solved by an education ministry only, or problems such as privacy cannot be solved uh, also by an education ministry only. We need really different policies to come together um, and to be integrated um, in what is really a complex exercise of modernizing our education and training systems. Uh, last but not least, the lifelong learning approach, which I, uh, which I have mentioned. Uh, the first action plan was um, around formal learning only. Now we have um, extended this um, to uh, cover also lifelong learning, non-formal and informal learning. Now, um, one of my favorite parts uh, is to talk about um, operations and uh, details and things that we are actually doing. Uh, so let me just uh, walk you through some of those. Um, and um, let's start by um, what I think um, was a very successful Erasmus, uh, extraordinary Erasmus call for digital education readiness. Last year, when um, the crisis hit, uh, we really uh, immediately had the reflex, okay, we cannot just continue business as usual with the normal call, which was already sort of underway. We really need to think about what is necessary out there. Um, we launched the Extraordinary Erasmus call in the summer, which um, attracted um, more than 2,500 applications for strategic partnerships and this is around digital education readiness. So this was a small litmus test of the actual demand that there is. And we have, if anything, been completely, um, let's say, um, vindicated or justified by, the, by our assumptions. So therefore, um, we have already, uh, as you know, uh, we have had also the Erasmus calls this year. We have in the key action two, the uh, cooperation projects around digital transformation for any type of education and training institution. Uh, not primary only or secondary or higher, any type. And then we have extended uh, the digital opportunity traineeships um, now to cover also VET, no longer just higher education, but also VET and also staff. And we are very, very happy that we have managed to extend this, this um, uh, traineeship scheme. Um, we are currently in the process of um, adopting or, or let's say achieving uh, hopefully the adoption 
at the Commission level of a proposal for a Council recommendation on distance and online learning for primary and secondary. Um, why uh, we have seen really a um, burning um, need to address the questions of distance and online for primary and secondary in particular. This is where um, I believe a lot of uh, work needs to be done. And the Commission has been working on this actually in the last nine months. Uh, we are very close to it uh, right now and hope to be able to adopt this during the Slovenian presidency and probably we will see some work there um, uh, on, on the follow-up of this council recommendation. We are also discussing um, internally uh, with um, um, different uh, political um, leaders in the commission um, how to uh, engage the member states um, politically on uh, a dialogue with commitments to accelerate and to uh, implement really digital education. This is what we call uh, a strategic dialogue with member states on the enabling factors. I have mentioned the whole government approach. This is the way we would like to do it. Um, I hope to be able to, 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 to say a little bit more in a couple of weeks from, uh, from now. Uh, but it, the intention really is to engage the member states and to have them agree around common uh, factors uh, for digital education. Um, then we have, um, uh, I will say a, a few words about the platform and the content just in a second, but let me mention two types of guidelines for educators that we are going to develop. We have launched and in fact already closed a call for setting up an expert group, um, a commission expert group on um, the use of uh, artificial intelligence and data for educators. Uh, that one uh, has been uh, closed um, a couple of weeks ago. We're about to send out the, um, the confirmations and then uh, we'll organize the launch of this group in July. Uh, the objective is to prepare pragmatic and practical guidelines for educators such as headmasters, teachers, um, on uh, let's say, some of the implications of AI and data in education and training. And then um, similar approach, um, but with a very different objective, namely to promote digital literacy and to tackle disinformation. Um, again, based on a commission expert group that um, we are about to uh, set up as well, the call is still ongoing until um, next week, Tuesday. And we will then also set up a similar process in motion that will take, uh, in both cases, around 12 months. So hopefully next year for back to school in autumn, we will be able to present those guidelines on AI and data on the one side and how to tackle disinformation and um, uh, through education. Um, we are also um, uh, launching preliminary work on how to improve the provision of digital skills and competences through education and training. Uh, I have mentioned that we need to probably accelerate or do some of the things differently in order to achieve some of the objectives we have set ourselves. And maybe um, also in, um, in this list, I can also mention that we have launched a uh, feasibility study for a European exchange platform, um, which in fact is meant to um, look into how to provide for uh, means to find specific, um, uh, specific uh, content, which is multilingual, high quality. Um, and um, we have not yet defined the target sector of such a European exchange platform, but um, we have organized some initial um, uh, consultations and we have um, already seen that, for example, um, there appears to be some potential for this idea in the context of the European universities. Uh, this is to be continued. This feasibility study is ongoing until autumn this year, and uh, there is um, interviews going on. So for those of you that might be interested in um, contributing to this, you can, you can uh, contact and reach, us, uh, reach out to us. And uh, quite similar um, in terms of, um, let's say, uh, field, but um, a different type of action is the digital education content framework. Just let me say a few words on this. This is a longer term action. Um, we have seen through COVID that um, a content is, is a key question. Uh, its production and its use has increased a lot. Um, but we see very interesting developments. For, for example, on the supply side, um, we said that traditional producers of such education content, 
see the emergence of competing or complementary supply from public authorities or from commercial players. Um, this uh, challenges some of the business models that exist. On the other side, um, we see on the demand side, we see teachers and pupils who adapt their habits and become active co-creators. And we will be launching a, um, a study on this uh, to look into the supply and the demand side and to see how perhaps we can propose a set of um, soft policy measures that can include guidance, maybe some uh, standardization or other industrial agreements, uh, or perhaps incentivize certain development through, through funding. And then uh, I have said that I will make an, a small announcement uh, here, and I will do so. Um, uh, you will actually have the opportunity to attend the um, workshop with my colleague, Anuska Ferrari. But I would like to announce, because the time is uh, really excellent for it, that um, one of our key flagship initiatives, the Digital Education Hub, is about to take uh, shape. And we have yesterday launched uh, an open call for tender to, um, um, uh, for supporting activities of the Digital Education Hub. Um, the idea is to support a cross-sectoral community to enable knowledge exchange and um, sharing and to accelerate innovation in education. Why do we need this? Well, um, I think that we still have a problem in Europe when it comes to cooperation and exchange on digital education uh, at EU level. And we believe that with the setup of um, such activities through this call and also some of the other points that I'm mentioning here, uh, which I will not go into the details now, but um, which are all encompassing, uh, we will be able to improve this type of cooperation um, in the field of digital uh, education. And uh, I will post in a second the, the, the link to the, um, uh, to the call. And I want to, find, uh, to finish my, uh, my presentation today with a couple of remarks. Um, so uh, I think um, it is um, for us quite important to pass the message that digital education um, should be perceived as a strategic goal to address the digital transformation of society. It, it cannot be looked into isolation, um, even though sometimes the legal competences uh, seem to be standing in the way. It is very, very important to look at it uh, from the, from the uh, bigger picture of what is happening in the society, in the economy, uh, in the labor market. We have also proposed universal digital education to, um, uh, to promote digital citizenship. This is in the compass, in the digital compass. And I, I would just say that uh, education is a basic human right. And if for some reason people do not have access to physical education, then uh, we should make sure that at least we have access through digital means since uh, digital is kind of everywhere. It's not the best always, uh, not even often, but um, it needs to be addressed. Um, and uh, we need teachers and trainers who are competent and confident. So we have to do a bit more on the continuous professional development and reskilling and upskilling. Um, digital skills and competences are very, very important to continue to be supported, but we need to look deeper into the digital world and we need to equip pupils, students with an even better understanding of what is happening. Why? Because everyone knows what is gravity. Uh, everyone knows the basic chemical processes, but there are not that many yet that know how, for example, basic algorithms work, how they amplify specific things or how biases are created. And it is important to support this through education and training, through computer science, through an enlarged set of disciplines with computational thinking and the like. Um, I have mentioned the digital education content. Um, let me just flag that uh, all of it uh, should be provided also on platforms that are fostering privacy and reflect European values. They are not necessarily the same everywhere around the world. And last but not least, um, the key question of accountability. Um, well, to transform education in the digital age, I think you know much better than me, is a task which takes perhaps much more than the 30 years even. Um, it is a shared challenge. It cannot be um, outsourced to one ministry only or one institution. It needs to be a common and shared responsibility. And only that's uh, a way that can actually support us to achieve the objectives we have set ourselves. Thank you very much for your attention and looking forward to comments or questions.
Thank you, Gergi, uh, for very, very interesting and very important presentation with messages that uh, concerns us all, uh, because uh, we all have to think uh, about uh, uh, these issues. Uh, uh, first uh, thing with, which came to my mind is uh, when you were mentioning the Erasmus projects and, and the number of uh, applications when it launched was the part for, for COVID, how many people reacted. It just shows the importance importance of collaboration, of joint efforts, doesn't it? Uh, because of such high number of, of applications you received. And this is something I think which shows a positive, uh, a positive improvement in the way that uh, uh, the people realize that only jointly they can make some changes. What do you think about that? Does it uh, give you the same, uh, uh, same uh, reflection as well? Uh, absolutely, uh, Sandra, I would 100% uh, agree that, um, um, I mean, cooperation is the best way forward. Um, not only it, it is natural for, for, for people to cooperate as, as uh, let's say, uh, social uh, creatures to when, when, when we advance, we normally don't do it on our own completely. We never do that as individuals. We, we cooperate with others. Uh, but it's also uh, necessary because of the type of... Um, uh, specific uh, challenges which are intrinsic to the to the modernization of education in the digital age. So there is just not a single person or a single ministry or a single institution that can manage this type of complexity. And uh, it's it's part of modern life to have complexity. And part of the the the, the solution is to cooperate to solve it. So fully agree with you. Yeah, great. Uh, we have some questions related to. Uh, K2 open call open now or how about capacity building activities? I think that they can find this at the uh, European Commission web pages. So uh, this is just a ma matter of finding the information. But uh, let's start with some questions. Uh, Andres is asking, would the digital education action plan address in a way, one way or other, the global challenges like movements in digital uh, learning, US, China, Asia? So how do Europe reflect to that? Well, <clears throat> I think that um, part of the reason why we are proposing to uh, have uh, a more integrated um, and uh, more, uh, if you like, um, uh, cooperate, cooperative approach uh, at the European level on digital education is because we do see certain developments uh, coming out either from the US or from, uh, from China that uh, necessitate, necessitate uh, a European approach. So um, I wouldn't speculate to say that we're going to see uh, sort of a European answer, but I can definitely say that we will see a European um, a flavor more and more uh, when it comes to the, uh, the, the kind of uh, digital edu education challenges that we share. And the member states seem to be agreeing that uh, they share a lot because they have adopted council conclusions uh, last December for the first time on digital education. I don't want to bore the audience with, uh, with bureaucratic, um, bureaucratic instruments, but I, let me just say that whenever uh, member states, all of them agree uh, on something in the council, then chances are that they would perhaps continue to work in this direction. So they have agreed that they share quite a lot uh, of challenges in digital education. And I believe that there are certainly some examples that will require um, us to look into possible answers sooner rather than later and things like privacy or data come uh, immediately to mind. Um, yeah, so these are some, some, some reactions for me. Uh, great. When you, when you say about member states and that they have all adopted, uh, I will very much welcome the strategic dialogue with member states uh, on the evaluation uh, uh, enabling factor for successful digital education because it can be uh, some way of uh, uh, checking if they are actually uh, uh, doing uh, uh, what they uh, agreed uh, upon to, and uh, certainly sometimes it's very much needed. Okay, let's move to another question. Uh, we have a question from Ursula. She says, uh, thank you, Gergi, for this very uh, comprehensive overview. Can you please let us know about health component of digital education? It seems that we have to take care of mental and physical health when using digital tools and content. This is something very related to the well-being, which has become quite an uh, important issue for the last year. 
Uh, absolutely. I think that the, um, the problem is clear. Um, I would not really um, say that we are offering that many solutions at this stage with the Digital Education Action Plan. We have seen through the open public consultation that the problem is there already in, in, in this summer period, which I've mentioned, um, the message came through clearly. Um, what we are doing a bit, let's say, concretely to say uh, here to answer the question, maybe to try to answer the question, is um, I mentioned the um, proposal for a council recommendation on primary and secondary. Uh, we are giving there a lot of guidance around good and, um, let's say, meaningful practice of uh, hybrid, blended type of learning for primary and secondary. Um, then, uh, secondly, we are... Um, obviously, uh, through the guidelines that we are uh, developing for educators around uh, digital literacy, let's say, um, uh, and also disinformation, tackling disinformation, because that can be also a huge cause of stress. Um, we are also going to be proposing some, some specific measures. Um, what is more important maybe to say here, uh, to finish with this comment, is that um, there are specific um, policy areas that um, uh, we cannot immediately address um, as, uh, let's say, um, uh, in the education uh, field. But we work closely, for example, with our colleagues from the Director General for Health. They are quite, um, uh, let's say, interested in the, in the mental health issues related to COVID, um, not necessarily coming out of use for, uh, let's say, online learning, but uh, in the general context of COVID. So we are providing as much as possible the, the kind of um, evidence we have. But I do believe that the, the mental health issue is, is just a little bit uh, too big maybe for us to try to address through the Digital Education Action Plan only. Yeah, thank you. I agree, but definitely something uh, which has to be uh, uh, taken in consideration very much. I would say that uh, all this uh, uh, situation uh, uh, which has uh, uh, come upon us uh, actually uh, ask for some interdisciplinary approach because we cannot stay uh, only in one uh, one uh, segment. Okay, let's move to another question. So I have a number of questions, so I'm sorry, but... Uh, uh, let's see. Team is asked, uh, it is clear that digital literacy and digital competence is still need to be reinforced uh, at the European level. This would be help uh, social inclusion. Do you think that initiatives you have presented will help the people who need this training and have been left behind standard education offerings? Uh, well, um, I would say that um, I would... Uh, strongly hope that this is the case um, because of maybe two, two, two let's, let's, let's take uh, the two parts uh, for, uh, for this question. So on the one side, um, uh, you're absolutely right that we, would, we need to, to further develop the type of literacy, um, the, the digital literacy and, and the competences. And um, we will continue to fund uh, and actually we'll provide more funding than ever before also through the uh, recovery and resilience plans uh, for the development of digital uh, competences and for promoting digital literacy. So um, if that would be a question of investment only, then there will be more. So I would say that um, uh, this is one part of the story and one part of the answer. Um, but then there is a different uh, part of the answer that I would provide, and it is that what is also important for us is to um, actually um, develop further the type of awareness um, that um, educators and uh, those responsible for decision making and in education um, uh, have around the importance of digital literacy. And um, we um, are, for this reason, for example, going to be developing those guidelines that I have mentioned on promoting digital literacy. We are also going to be working on a specific proposal for a council recommendation on improving the provision of digital skills through education and training. Why? Because um, we believe that um, if we were ever to reach the ambitious targets that uh, we have set ourselves or maybe to compete uh, with some other parts of the world, then we will have to expand also the pool of those that have this type of digital uh, literacy and skills. And uh, personally, I believe that um, 
uh, you can either expand, sort of you can ba basically make this bigger as an offering or um, the, the objectives would not be achieved. So we want to, uh, for example, I have mentioned it, work much more on uh, developing um, ideas around how to implement uh, things like computer science, informatics, computational thinking much wider uh, into the education provision um, since they are seen currently as very, very specialized subjects. Um, but they are quite foundational, uh, as I would argue. And um, we think that this is one of the ways actually to, to, to increase the role of education in, in, in reaching this type of uh, competences. Thank you. Uh, well, we are coming to the end of the time. Uh, we have two more questions. Diana has been asking about Digital Education Hub. I will just direct her to the workshop, which is going to be at 11.30, uh, led by Anushka Ferrari on Digital Education Hub. So I'm certain she can get all the information there. And the last question is from Irina. Uh, we have been already saying something about digital, uh, about member, member states' uh, priorities and consultations and th things uh, around that. So uh, maybe I will leave this question if you would like to answer something in the chat. Um, in the end, I would just uh, would like to thank you very much for this very important uh, presentation. You provide us with the number of information which uh, uh, are important to all of us who are working in uh, education and run around education uh, to know how to take necessary steps further or how to contribute uh, to uh, development of, of all these activities. And at the end, I just can say that Eden is here as a channel to to distribute, to disseminate the information from the one way, but also to gather the expertise and the know-how and to uh, give it to the European Commission to take the further steps. So thank you for your presentation. Thank you, and I very much appreciate this opportunity. Thank you. Okay, let's move to another uh, plenary we have today. Um, I'm very happy that today with us is Manuel Castro from UNED. Uh, he's an electrical and computer uh, engineering professor, professor in Spanish University of Distance Education. <coughs> he's an expert in applications of simulation and electronics in technology and hence teach, uh, learning. He co-chaired uh, co the number of conferences, uh, among them the IEEE, and uh, where he is also a uh, President uh, Emeritus of IEEE Society and past director of IEEE Division uh, 6. He has been awarded uh, for, from a number of associations, but just to mention that he is an honor, uh, ambassador of Madrid Convention Bureau and co-editor of IEEE Rita. So you have really a, a big uh, uh, CV. I don't have time to read it, but certain that the participants uh, will can take uh, information from the uh, conference website. Uh, we are very much looking forward to your uh, presentation uh, titled Adapted Education for All, the Long Wait from Distance Online Through Pandemic. Challenging title. Manuel, we are very much looking to hear about that. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sandra, and thank you very much for the Eden uh, invitation. Thank you to Tim Reed, that was the person that uh, bring me the, this opportunity. And it's a really challenge to be uh, after Gregor Georgi uh, speaking because it's really complicated to, to compete with the, with the European Union when they develop this kind of, of future path uh, for our education activities. And we have to go to the desk to start to working in the next uh, proposals as we have to do it. But I, I will try in any case there. I will share my screen. Uh, here it is. Okay. I will try to, to put, as, as you say in the, in the, in the title, is Adapted Education for All, the long way from distance online through pandemic. I am working inside the UNED, the Spanish University for Distance Education, for the last 35 years. I entered in the UNED in the 84, 1984, it's really a long time ago of this moment. But uh, before to do, uh, I'd like to make a, a short, uh, a short uh, remark about some things there. 
First of all, is that I will try to do a, a flipped keynote. I will completely change the things because we are really boring about the standard keynotes we do in, in the pandemic time. We have a lot of conference, virtual conference, and, and the online really stresses us. And I will try to be a little bit things different in this, in this sense there. Then I will try to do a, a flipped keynote. I will start by the end with the, with the, with the acknowledgement and the recognizements and the conclusions. And later on, I will put some pictures of the things that I will use it to support the conclusions I will, I will do there. This will be an experiment. I hope you, you enjoyed this because we are in the, in an area of, of educators. We are in the, in the way of the engineering educators in my, in my field, but in the education in general, in, in online and distance environments. And I will to do, try to do this. First of all, I want to thanks to the IEEE. As, as Sandra said, uh, IEEE is the electrical and computer engineers association in the world. We are more than 400,000 people in the world trying to do a better technology for humanity. And I would like to thank them as the education society, the opportunities they bring to me. Of course, I have in, in mind the e Madrid. E Madrid is a, a network, an excellence network inside Madrid for education and for education in engineering. I like to do this kind of, uh, of knowledge to the UNESCO chair of distance education and my department, of course, and my, and my institution. In general, the education and the adapting education, as I said, is a multifaceted thing there. As you can see here, we have to educate the people, of course. This is our major part of the, of the resources we put and the activities we do and the organization, planning, and so on there. But this is a really multifaceted there. And normally, in the day-to-day the -day activities we have in the face-to-face -to -face or in distance or in, in online or in hybrid or, or in blended environment in distance in education, we only have a couple of faces, but we have a really multifaceted there. And in the day-to-day -day activities, sometimes we forget the, the, the real important faces there. The real important faces is the, as I told you, we, we used to speak now for the blended education. Blended is the personalized education. Everyone knows this term today. And we try to put on, on, on site, but, but we, are, we, are, we are just blended mainly to the way to do the education, for the face-to-face -face or to the distance or to the online education. It's, the, it's, the, it's some kind of methodology, some kind of orientation, some kind of scheduling there. But we have in the multifacial activities a lot of more different things there. For example, the diversity. We have to be really aware of the diversity as we need to put all the people, different kind of people, different sex, gender, activities there. We have to really be aware of these kind of things there. And minorities, of course. We have a lot of minorities in our world, different kind of minorities that we have to, to be man, special needs, of course, special for physical needs, mind needs, and so on there. It's really important. All of these things go to the adaptation of education, but I'm not speaking today about adaptation. I like to speak about adapted. Adapted should be for all the students. For example, in my university in UNED, as you know, we are one of the largest universities in Europe. We have more than 200,000 students in distance education, in online education, but every one student is different. We don't have two exactly the same students there. And we have to adapt our student, our environment, our learning management systems, our activities there for each one of the students. It's impossible, of course, to have this kind of this adapted thing for 200,000 students in a large university or in a modern university in, in education. But we have to focus, and they must believe that they are really different for each one of them. And we must transmit this kind of things for the, for the people. In this kind of tributes, I will start for the chair of the distance education, as I told you, the UNESCO chair of distance education. The past chair was uh, Lorenzo Garcia Aretio. He was retired some years ago in UNED. I'd like to tribute him for the work he did for a lot of years. And I'd like to stress in the first time for the, the definition of education he did in the 1989. This definition say that education is the process of intentional and comprehensive optimization of women and men oriented to her or his complete self-realization and active insertion in the nature, society, and culture. This definition he did, because he tried to have a, a, a new orientation in the definition of education, was in the 1989. 
And what's really complete is completely, uh, actually, it's too completely present today. All this kind of definition goes to the equality, inequality, and equity in learning constants, as he said in, the, in a blog that he developed in the last week. Sorry. In the last week, he developed uh, an entrance in a blog, in a blog to say that we must to improve, we must to integral the education, we must to be intentional in education, <coughs> We must to try that the students will be autonomous <clears throat> in education and they have to socialize in education. And I like from here to have a special tribute to my colleague, Angel Sanchez Elvira, that is the new chair of the uh, distance education UNESCO chair in the UNED. And he should be here in my position making the keynote today, but the problem that the COVID has to all the families in, in the world has affected her really uh, in depth, and I'd like to bring my, uh, my sympathies from here. And I'd like to continue with this tribute and main conclusion with some really good words from uh, my colleague, Tony Bates. When we talk about online education, distance education, people believe that uh, online and distance is a complete different way of education. Today not, because all the face-to-face -face colleagues of the world and all the face-to-face uh, students in, from the K-12 to the secondary high schools and universities. This in the last uh, near half, one and a half year did online education, but sometimes in different conditions there, but they are not really conditioned. The thing is that the, as a, some accepts that Tony Bates said that, that the good teaching may overcome a poor choice of technology, but the technology will never save <clears throat> bad teaching. This is really important. We have to do a really good teaching and we can use the best technology for the teaching. This is part of the distance and the online education there. But we need to have a really good teaching in any case, and really good adapted teaching for the media and for the technology we like to use, to use there. Learning online is a bit different. We need uh, students that should be really able or should be really engaged or should be try to, to have these activities there. But it's really important. The personal priorities are really important in this online learning world, and we like to we have to increase the access and flexibility, developing 21st century skills, reducing inequalities is the big thing, and this is the main objectives we have in mind when we talk about online education and distance education, and increase the cost effectiveness. Of course, the distance education is is, is has more cost effectiveness than the face-to-face -face education, but not is infinitum in this cost of activities. There. It's impossible to do a good education with really few and scarce resources. As I told you, we will continue in the way of the, of the flipped keynote, and I will do my, my like remarks. I started, as I told you, in 1983. When I started in distance education in the UNED, I was, during five years, I was working too in a face-to-face -face university in the Polytechnic University of Madrid. And these uh, parallel activities in the both environments, in distance and face-to-face, -face, bring me a lot of, uh, of new ideas to do this kind of thing. At these moments in 1983, we have the world <coughs> separated by the face-to-face -face environment, distance environment, and missing environment. And of course, in the 2000, 20 years ago, 24, 21 years ago, we have, in this case, the only changes we have was the distance online world, face-to-face, -face, and blended learning environments that we have there. We use a lot of technology enhanced learning activities there. We, we do the distance, online, synchronous, asynchronous, formal, like learning, and formal technology enhanced learning. And all of this bring to us to the COVID environment. When we arrive in the 2020, in the, in the pre-COVID, all the world was really uh, moving away, was really everything was, has no borders distance online, face-to-face, -face, and blended environment was permanent. And you can be one, one, from one place to other place in really seconds trying to do these kind of things. You see a lot of things there, virtual and software, simulation, augmented reality, active learning, social media. The evolution of the technology and the evolution of the implementation of the technology in education was so high in these last 21 years. But the COVID changed completely the things there. I always really like this... Uh, this metaphor about that when we have the, 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 to put away uh, the things in, in the education 
and the people started to do in last year in March 2020, a lot of people say, how can I use the online to survive in the education in online world when you are face to face, as well as we do in, in the online activities there. For the people that was in, in distance on online education, we continue moving the ball. We try to move a ball and the mool you can move smoothly or more hard, but it's a, it's a ball. But for the people that was in face to face, it was like a really a square, a cube that you have to move. It's really complicated to move a, a cube. You need to have tools to move a cube like the all Egyptians and all the people there moving with the real stones there. But the, the, this kind of things in the pandemic time uh, has to us a lot of uh, a lot of impact in the world. The remote and education have now some goes and backs for the people. Some people like it, some people don't like it. This is really complicated for the for the people there. We have some bad credibility, but we lost credibility in other places because some people did a really bad online education because they don't have the the, the background, they don't have the, the things they have to do it. Quality sometimes was good, quality sometimes was not good, evaluation costs and cut-offs. Some people was cut off in this case. And the adapted environment is like a blended plus learning center. We have to be in mind that <clears throat> the online education and the distance education is a different way of education, and we need a lot of more actors involved there. We need the teachers, of course, that we have in the regular face-to-face -face educations. We need the students, but all of these kind of people are are having activities there. That's mini trade instructional designers, content designers, curators, tutors, animators, peer students or senior students, all of them can have the roles they need to have in distance and online education. And of course, the work and the family and the social relations. I will say in a couple of slides that we have this kind of, of problems there as they have in activities there. We have the, the pandemic timing really in, from one month to the other. From February to September, the last year, we, we was completely quiet in February 2019. We was uh, doing a lot of things and everything was okay. I was visiting three continents during the February 2019. I was in Japan, in the United States, in Europe in one month, but suddenly everything goes out. The pandemic came. From a complete mobility, we was to a complete lockdown, and this is really complicated for us to, to, to adjust. And we will go in the future to a hybrid, hybrid world. We don't know how this hybrid world will be. We don't know how long this hybrid world will be with us, but they will be. In any case, there are a lot of opinions for this kind of, of pandemic time there. For example, in one journal in Spain, they say that in 60 days, only three months, two months of confinement. We have for, for some people six months, one year confinement and, and, and lockdown. They accelerated six years in worldwide digitalization. Of course, in some industry they did, in some universities too. But a lot of people is trying to go back to the, la, to the old good times that we have there. We don't know, but that is sure is that we have a really a lot of overwork. People do a lot of overwork during this one and a half year with higher costs. And this was in all the aspects, in online events, online education, teleworking, and e-commerce. For example, for our students, uh, our students in the distance education used to be really quiet students. They are really self-organized students. They are really adult students in general. But it changes the framework. They changes the environment. At home, they used to study alone in some quiet place for them. During the pandemic time, they had to study it with all the family, with child, with parents, uh, with working at the same time in teleworking. This changes completely, and this stresses them a lot. This is really important, the health support we have to bring to them as the, uh, as, as the European Union will do it, and all the people in, in, the world, in the world is doing this kind of mental issues we have now for the student people and for the working people in all the world. It's really important to have this thing in mind. But for example, we did two in the events. We have this event in online activities there. We expect at the end of the year, we'll, I will have in Madrid in November one conference, is the WIF, the World Engineering Education Forum, is a worldwide education. And I expect to have some people in Madrid in my university. I expect to have 100, 200 people in Madrid, another 600 people 
online in all the world. But this is really complicated for us. I estimated the overwork for the organizer of a virtual conference around 200 to 300% more work than the regular one you have to do in face-to-face -face activities. It's really complicated. And for the, for the authors and for the people working in a conference, the estimated overwork used to be from 150 to 200% there. I really, uh, I really have some really good memories for this kind of activities there. This is the, the last big conference we have in, in Educon 2019 in Dubai in April. There was a really good time there. We have a lot of colleagues together. But my first thing is this one. This is the, the things I told you in and gender and minorities there. We was in Dubai. We have a really bunch of really wonderful women in this case doing engineering activities there. And we are really proud of this kind of activities there. And this is the things we have to be in mind. This is the first part of the flipped keynote. I bring you all the information. And now this is the time of the research topics. I will talk a little bit about some research I did, I did for to, to have this information on the wine there. I will talk a little bit about the education evolution, social differences and framework, practical work and competences, standards in remote laboratories, technology enhanced learning to open education and smart world to smart education. The good thing the, and the good part of the flip it, you know, is we can put out some one of this part if we have no time or we have to stress and to focus in some part. The, the, the flip it environment bring us a lot of new tools that we can use it there. For example, if we have some audience like you that you, you used to be aware of all the things in the education evolution, we can put this part away and we can have faster and nothing happened in this case. Just to have these things of the evolution of the education in the world, we started from the old times of the, of the Greeks and the peripathetic uh, activities for the education, to the medieval age, to the 19th century and the massified classrooms in the 20th century there. And we are now in the social media era. This is really important. The education 4.0 is more education. We'll talk a little bit more in the future of that. But I'd really like this kind of, 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 of future vision of the things. In 1910, in the 20, beginning of the 20th century, Bill Mars, some French author, said that in the future, all the students will learn from the mind activities there. They will be transmitted, not with the books. They will transmit all the knowledge of the books being in the mind in the same time. My colleague Rob really used this uh, paragraph and this uh, metaphor in Spain at the beginning of the, of the 21st century. But this is the same thing that we have in the matrix, of course. Uh, matrix has the same things. You connect it to a machine. The machine brings you the information, and you can put in this one. Artificial intelligence and machine learning will bring to us. But this not will be for the next year, and probably not in the next decades. But in the future, sometime, probably we'll have this kind of things there. But today, we are in the digitization and social media era. We have to work in the mobile and social applications. We have to work in libraries with no books, we have all the information in the library, but you will not read a book. You will use the tablet, you will use the digital media, you will share information with the people there, you will have meetings and you will work together with the people in the library, but you will not have to see the real book in the, in the moment. We have now in the world a lot of new libraries without book that should be bringing to the, to the user there. And we are in the world of the ubiquitous, of course. This is really important to the ubiquitous activities there. We have to learn and we have to connect to the education, to the things in any place, anywhere, any moment, any device, any content, any connection, any competence. This is really important and mainly for the practical competences we have in engineering education there. We was in the, in the, in the era of the MOOCs. Uh, we have a really good MOOC that we have in the 2014 the Moodle MOOC on with IKEA DNA for a 21st century educator. We act like a, a robot, right? like a mega robot for education. This is really important. The contents, of course, we continue having the contents as the really, really important things, but the engagement is really important, assessment, reflection, and transmission, of course. But we can have informal things. They're critical thinking, clinical learning, confidence, and continuous education, but the engagement is the much more things. It's really complicated to engage 
the students if they don't like to be engaged, of course, in any moment. And we are in the time of the, of the different definitions of technology and education. Ubiquitous, artificial intelligence, adaptive, open, disruptive, deep learning, flipped, hang, hangouts, games like, uh, bring you other device, uh, addictive, machine learning. This is all the things are changing our activities and general things. If you are new in the online or distance education world, this should sometimes have overworking you, and you can see this one. This was the things that the people that came from the face-to-face -face environment to the online learning environment have when they try to start in the pandemic time there. And we evolved from the 1919 to the 2020 environment in the education. We worked from the contents, mainly oriented to contents in 1919s. In the 2000, we were oriented to the platforms, to learning management systems and analytics, later on repositories. And in 2020, we are really involved in the analytics time, in the mobile learning and the big data and social learning there. We change a lot the, the, the vision and you're changing a lot the, the environment there. But why do we have to do these changes? Why we did these changes in the moment? Because we have a lot of social difference and different frameworks there. We increase the number of people, of course. If you have a really short vision of the people during the time, a lot of time ago, we have only 100,000 people in Africa one million years ago. In the time of the Roman Empire, only 2,021 years ago, we have 200 million people in the world. 50, 50, 50 million uh, people was in the Mediterranean area, 50 million in China, and the other half in all the world. In the 18th century, in the Industrial Revolution, we have 1,000 million people in this moment. This is the, 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 the first real industrial revolution. In the 2021, we are in the ICT revolution, and we expect to have around 2016, 10,000 million people in the world. We are continuing increasing, but slowly. Chinese people has now decreasing in general. I, India people continue going up. Some African countries continue going up. We are slowly down. 20 years ago, we expect to be in 2015, the 10,000 million people. We are now delayed to 2060. Probably we will arrive in 2075, but we will arrive in some moment or the last. But these changes are really important in the world. People is moving. People is moving from the center of the, of the continents to the border of the continent. We have a skin effect in the world, mainly trying to find water, of course. This skin effect is really important, for example, in Africa, as you see there, in Asia, in South America. It's not so important, of course, in Europe or in the United States, because we are a small areas, really high populated there. But it's really important in all the world, these kind of things, because they are affected to the media, to the technology, communication, commerce, climate, and we have larger differences in our world. We have larger differences in trading, for example. Now, Europe is one of the hubs of the world, together with North America and Asia. We are a trading hub in the world there. And we have a lot of people, as we say. But for example, in 2014, the first time I did this, this research, we saw two new countries in the world. China was the first country, India was the second one, Facebook was the third one, with 1,000 million people in 2014. And Twitter was the third one, with 500 people there, more than USA. What happened in this moment? We have a really large penetration of internet. Internet was around 40% penetrated in the world. But yesterday, excuse me, I have here a mistake, it's 2020, 06, I was not 10 years ahead. And yesterday I did some kind of final research and updated it, and now all the major countries in the world are internet-oriented. Facebook has 2,700 million people, Google applications, 2,030 millions, YouTube and WhatsApp, 2,000 millions, China and India was a little bit down, WeChat, Instagram, LinkedIn and Twitter are going down a little bit, but the major part of the world is internet. Internet is the world for everybody. We increase the penetration. We are now around 60% penetration of internet in the world. All the people communicate by mobile phones. The fixed lines are continuing to go down and, and go to disappear. 
And the, one of the things we have changed in the last decade is the use of the, of the, of the TV and the digital media. Around 2011, 2011 in the United States, they was brought down, and now the digital media is close to 40% more than the TV in the United States. This is really important for the young generations, this kind of challenges there. Population and the penetration has really different there. Main population and penetration are United States, Europe, and far Asia countries like Japan or other countries there. But we have to continue having some issues in these things. North America has their own issues. They continue going a larger penetration, European Union. But the cyber technologies, cyber geographies, and cyber security are really important in the way. This is really affect our things in education because education is part of the cyber world for the future. The world is changing, and the world is changing in education. I really like this view, as we have the major countries we have in, in the world. We have in Spain here a really small one there, but European in general is a country that we can see that European Union is larger of this one. But we have different activities there. For example, in, in the United States area, in North America, the, the issues we have in education is the accreditations, research, teaching, and the recovery of the investment of the higher education people need to recover normally 20 years or 30 years. They have a lot of issues in the budget for the recovery of the, the money they are spending in higher education to be recovered there. In Europe, for example, we have the issues are the mobility, the Bologna process, the European higher education activities there, and the open access and the open education for all the people. There. South America, they have a different issues there in education, lots of the human capital because they go to a study outside, they go to study abroad, and a lot of times they don't come back with the information they receive there. The stability, of course, and the difference in, in money there. This is similar to the Africa. They have stability, distances, and a lot of different languages that can have issues there in some moments. There. And of course, in the part of the Far Asia, in the Japan, they have a lot of increase in private education. This is really important for them to try to be the best education in the world. In the countries in, in, the, in the Asia, in India and China, explosion and the sizes and the public-private fighting there. Or for example, in, in Australia, they have the distance and the integration of the education as part of the system. This is really important for the people there. But we are inside the fourth industrial revolution. The fourth industrial revolution is really affecting all the work we have, all the activities we have there are really important things there. And we are changing, of course, the, 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 the occupations and the activities. We are having putting out a lot of office and administrative people, manufacturing people, construction and extraction people, and they are increasing business and financial operations, management, computer and mathematics, architects, engineers, sales. We have to reconvert a lot of people from one work to another work. And the, 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 the worst part is that more than half of the employment that we'll have in 10 years are not existing today. We have to prepare the students for a new work. They don't know what will be in 10 years. This is really important for the people there because the occupations and the real new uh, industry and new students didn't know what will have in the future. But this is the future we have. You know, European Union, for example, is trying to reduce the impact of these things with a new fifth industrial revolution. They try to have a more personal vision of the industrial revolution for all the people. There. And of course, this is part of the disruptive creation of the world because we have this disruptive activities there. We have three approaches for these kind of things, in-house innovation for the enterprises, industries, partnership, and quality technology. But the more important data I have to manage here is that the more than 60% of the worldwide executives and close to 80% of United States executives are concerned because they see the technology change in the industry are really to the speed. They are really fast for them. They cannot digest the change we have now for the people and for the industry. And this is really important because if our executives are not really well and not really acquired of the things they are doing, we can have problems in the future, of course. But all of these things affect our world. The intelligence is changing. We have in the old times only say we are only one intelligence. Today we have more than a dozen of different intelligence there. And we are now having a lot of things impacting of the emotional and social intelligence. We have to start people for the young child 
to be aware of the needs of the emotional and social intelligence and how they will handle in the future this kind of things. This is part of the mental health and the mental activities we have to do for the future and to manage all the things there. And we have, of course, the things of the generations. Every generation is completely different for the, all the ones there. We have in the last uh, 60 years, several generations, the old builders after the World War II, baby boomers, I am a baby boomer for the 1958. Then we are having a really good time to live there, generation X, generation Y, generation C, the millennials, my daughters are millennials, and now we are in the general alpha. My grandson is from the general alpha there. They are completely different people. They have different attitudes. They have different things for life. They have different way to study. They have different way to communicate. We have to be aware to this and have this in mind, depending the level and the generation you are talking about, you have to be this in mind. I'm an engineer, as I told you. Then, as I'm an engineer, I'd like to, to say something about uh, practical competences. This is really important in my life as an engineer to have the practical competences. We need to touch. We need to touch things. And of course, we are doing distance and online education. Then one of the things we try to promote there is the work with different levels of, uh, of activities there. For example, this is typical, the typical cycle design that I do in my, in my university, in a face-to-face -face university for the freshmen, sophomores, juniors, seniors. We start with theory contents, exercises, grading, evaluation, assessment, practical contents, real labs, and the final grading, uh, final evaluation, and final assessment. This is the typical one in the face-to-face -face and traditional education. But when we are working in a distance or online, we have to change this completely. For example, we have to introduce new uh, simulations, new virtual labs, new remote labs, new pocket labs, and of course the real labs there. But this is different for the freshmen, for the people that is really young there. They need to have a more traditional vision there with theory, practical contents, and exercises, and real labs than for the sophomore, junior, or senior people. In this case, we can introduce a lot of simulation because they are more mature to understand it. Virtual labs, remote labs, always the grading, evaluation, and assessments, and later to working with pocket labs or real labs. If you can go to the lab, it's better to use the real lab. If you will not go to the lab, it's better to use other different kind of labs. For example, we have here some short views of the real labs, traditional ones, simulators, different graphical user interface of them. We are in the area of the remote labs. We work a lot. The idea of the remote lab is to use the same lab that you use in the face-to-face -face lab, but using in the middle internet. We do this kind of labs for several years, 50 years ago, we developed a, <clears throat> a lab that we can move it by post mail. And of course, we are talking today about the Federation and Farm Labs in any way there. Of course, they have different labs for people there in photovoltaics, wind labs, or different labs we can use for the students depending on the level of the lab. There. Labs are really important, but it's really important to the standards. <clears throat> We are talking about standards. <clears throat> this is really important for them. And we prepared inside Triple E the first standard for smart learning objects and online laboratories there. This is the level one of the standards, the APIs, services, and metadata. We developed this standard in 2019. We developed the starting of the standards. And now, major part of the remote labs and major part of the activities we can do are doing this kind of a standard for the, for the future. And we are developing now a new standard, the standard for secure and trusted learning management, learning systems. This is really important because, as I told you, security is really important and we have to manage. I will do a really fast view of the tail and the smart world because I have in the last 10 minutes of my presentation. You know, all of you, about the education and the learning technologies and so on there. We was doing in the last 20 years a lot of work there in the traditional, mixed, distance, synchronous and asynchronous, formal, flipped continuous and informal, all the things that we are putting now in the learning management systems with the solutions there. And I will talk a little bit about that. We have an education, it's a, it's a thing of letters, of course. We put a lot of letters in the education, e-learning, blended learning, mobile learning, ubiquitous learning, pervasive. As we are moving away, we have it there. We never have X learning because we believe X is a sensory word there, but X probably in the future will be some kind of increasing on the learning from the people, we have augmented learning, of course, and so on there. 
we follow with the learning or the evolution of the ICTs and the computer things there. Every new activities in ICT, we are impl implementing and we are deploying in our, our learning activities. There. We are in the era of the web 4.0, we are in the era of the analytics, in the area of the intelligent, artificial intelligence, and we are putting all these things to work inside the education activities. We can have, of course, be sure that the, education, that the technologies are really good for our environment. All the technologies has the different activities there. We start to use, we trigger the technology, we overuse, stabilize. We have to be really aware of these kind of activities inside our world. And this is a really good view there. We have to be in mind that our students use the technologies that they use during their real life. If they use Twitter, Google Drive, YouTube, Google Search, PowerPoint, Evernote, Dropbox, they will continue using there. We cannot change the way the students do the applications. Of course, if we put a Moodle system, we put a learning management system, they will use it. But they will continue doing the things as they do in the past. And we must adapt our environment of the technologies to our students to try to, to, to improve the way they use the activities and applications they do for the real world. We have to be, of course, looking for the future in the technology application. We have the Horizon reports, or we have a Tel engineering education reports, and we can see there that the simulators, mobile and ubiquitous and e-learning platforms in 2011 were the things that the people bought and in 2019, for example, now, we continue having, as the most voted, the cloud computing, adaptive and personalized learning. We have the learning analytics, remote labs and virtual labs is the last survey we have for the future people. There. It's really important for these kind of things. We are moving from the open education. We are starting with the open learning environment. We did Merlot and OCWs in the past. We do we are going to do the things in the education activities there with the open education resources. It's really important to have these open resources for the open education there. As I told you, we started with open course words, we open to MOOCs. We believe the MOOCs are the best for the future and we develop a lot of MOOCs. We try to be in the way for the MOOCs, but a lot of people has issues there because the, MOOC, the MOOCs is not the future. The MOOCs is the present and the MOOCs was the past. It's a new tool that we have to use it there and we have to integrate these MOOCs in our learning system, of course. We did the first MOOC with remote laboratories. We did a lot of work in this area. We developed a lot of videos and, and self explanation things there. We put in this kind of activities, and we have a lot of people there. We have around 6,000 6, people working with remote labs in the 2014-2016. But finally, the people that really go to the end was around 500 people to all the things. But the really good thing is that a lot of people see these education activities there. We have to concentrate in the learning pyramid. We have to concentrate in the MOOCs, blended learning, and problem and project-based learning because they are the way to touch it and the way to do it. And we have to go to the open education. It's really important for the people to try to, to do these kind of things. We have to, to work with the MOOCs, but I like to work with MOOCs with quality, the C for quality, because we need to have a really high quality education for everybody in the world. And in this way, we are now in the smart world. We have to work in circular economy. This is really important for the people. Sustainability to try to be aware for the future. This is really important. All the things we talk in a smart world must be applied for the smart education for the future. Smart education is part of the smart society. We have to implement it. Digital education is the same concept there. We are in a connected world. Education is part of the connected world for the future, of course. We have to be in a personal city, as I told you. We have a lot of debate in the society from smart cities to intelligent personal cities. We have the same from the education, distance education to intelligent personal education for the people. We have to to be in this case using all the technologies we have in the world available to do our best education and trying to be part of the smart university for the people in the future. Smart education has smart technologies in everything, but in the middle is the same one. It's technology, processes, communication, collaboration, analytics. It's really important to be in the middle of this kind of thing. We have a lot of, uh, of things, uh, of 
associations that are working these kind of things. Eating is one of them. I really appreciate this. Asiatu, uh, Yafis, a lot of them. We have to concentrate in technology, learning, student-centered education, open, inclusive, social commitment, adaptive education. And finally, I will go back to the beginning. Thank you very much for your attention. I'll try to transmit a lot of things in this only 40 minutes. I believe I, I, I did it, it. I hope you enjoyed it. But remind that we are in a multifaceted world. We are not in a wrong world, really are a multifaceted world. We had a lot of faces. We have to concentrate and try to have as much as possible faces as we can have in our distance and online learning as we are doing there. Please think in the diversity, minorities, special needs, but not only this environment. Please think in all of our students. Every student is different there, and we have to go to adapt all our education to all the students there. And thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoyed it, and we can have time for some questions there. Changes uh, has been happening. Definitely, one can see that you're engineer because you have put it in that uh, uh, way. Um, so um, we have some questions here. Uh, well, let's start first one with Maria uh, Spilka. She says drawing and parallel between a blended conference with blended teaching learning. Can you elaborate a little bit more about 200% greater workload in preparation, implementation, and realization? of a blended solution of Edicon? Yes, uh, as I told you, this is uh, estimations, of course. All the yeah. news in this case, you cannot do it. But last year, in, in 2020, in, in April, we have the first conference we had in, in, in online. We have to move from face-to-face -face conference, full face-to-face -face conference, as we did in the last years, to the, to the first online conference in April. In this case, we delay it from April to June because we don't have time to, to do it in, in April. And I was talking, I was involved in this conference a lot. I was not the organizer. I was only the, the, the chair of the steering committee of this conference. But I see all the work that people do to try to adapt to the new environment there. People know, of course, in this case, this conference was doing in, in WebEx, not in, in Zoom, but there was a, they use a, 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 a video conference systems. And we have to put a lot of people to work, much more people as, as you did in, in, the, in the time. For example, when you are working in, in this conference today, you don't have only a couple of chairs of the session. You have a couple of chairs plus a couple of technical chairs. You need technical chairs for all the technical activities there. This is an overhead of the things there. And the, the time you have to devote to working in, in an online world, not in a face-to-face -face world, in an online world, I estimate in the, in the double, more or less. I will have a conference in, in, in November, as I told you, as a hybrid conference. Probably will be the first hybrid conference we have. We will have 200 people in Madrid, in the UNED, in the building, in the Humanities building in the UNED in Madrid. Probably you know because you was a lot of time in the UNED in Madrid. And, but I, have, I will, will have 600 people online. The integration of the two worlds to try for all the people that is in online to be as there was in Madrid, and the people in Madrid was to be as online, is a lot of effort too. You need a lot of more people. You need in these cases, not only a web system, not only a video conference system, you need to a platform to integrate them. You need an immersive and augmented platform to integrate them. For example, for the industry, if you have industry as sponsors, you need a way that the industry will be collaborating with the people will, will, because they need to sell the products there. And all of these things are a lot of overwork there. And of course, you need to have a lot of more overwork trying to manage people and so on. For, yes. for example, I was an author in mm -hmm. France too, and the time you have to spend to, to do a pre-recording video in the case you don't have final connection because you have some issues. Today we, have, we are really lucky because we don't have any cut in the internet, but two weeks ago, for example, in my, in my home, I, I live in the center of Madrid, really well connected because I'm in a really urban area, but sometimes we have cuttings in the internet. We don't know why, but we have cuttings. If we have a cut in this, during this one hour, we have a complete pain for the people. Then you, you must have a pre-recorded version of this one. All of this is around half to 
double of the overall world there. Well, uh, you mentioned at the beginning Tony Bates, and he recently said now it's time that we do not think uh, are we going uh, to face-to-face -face or online, that we now have to think how to take advantage of both of these to make the best. And uh, in light of uh, uh, that and the conferences you have mentioning, do you think that we are going to back to the full face-to-face -face conference or maybe the hybrid model will stay uh, something permanent? The, the good thing of the hybrid conference is the integration, the diversities and minorities, as I told you before. So a lot of people will cannot move in the future, in the near future. For example, now Latin American people has a lot of troubles in finance there because they are really affected by the pandemic. They cannot travel because they cannot, they don't have funds for travel. And if you put only face to face conference, you will miss these people. And this is really important people to do there. Or for example, I can be there, I, I'm back in it, I really well, I have my travel tickets, but the day before to go, I have some small peak of fever. Then I cannot travel. And this is really complicated for the people. We, we will have probably minimum of five years of a need to be hybrid environments for everything, for teaching, for, for conferences, for working, of course, because we will have a lot of uncertainty as what we will have To the tomorrow. Today, we are really, we believe we are safe because we have the vaccine, but we don't know what will happen the next year. Next year, people are saying that we have some aviary new grip, new uh, issue there. We'll have new versions and new SEPAs, new activities from the pandemic time. We don't know. It's impossible to know what we'll have now for the future. Of course, we have now the tools. This is the best thing. We have the tools. We have to go back to the traditional. I, I work, I, as I told you at the beginning, I was working for five years in face-to-face -face engineering in Madrid, in the Polytechnical University. And I love to do face-to-face -to -face learning too, because it's really important for any, any educator to have the, the, the presence of the students is really important for me. But I'm really well, I'm really moving well in, in distance and online education. But I like to have this one. With the people, the young students mainly, need to be face-to-face -face because education in a face-to-face -face university is not the education only. It's the cooperation, collaboration, go to the bars, play to cards. A lot of things that they do is the social part of the education, and this is really important. For example, in my university, we have 80 student centers in Spain to allow the students to be together and to try to see this kind of collaborative collaborative activities, because this is an integral part of the education too. The future is hybrid in any way there. You can have more face-to-face, -face, more online, or the, the way you, need, you will need in any moment there. But the future for sure will be hybrid. Good. Um... I think that, Tim, we have answered your question in that way because Tim has asked, uh, how do you see the new normal post-pandemic for higher education students? Will we go back to face-to-face -to -face and blended education? You have already answered, but maybe to extend uh, this question, uh, do you think that uh, campuses uh, are going to get a new role? Do you think the classrooms are going to get the new role if we go back to the classroom? I believe yes. I have a lot of connections with face-to-face uh, -face teachers because, uh, for example, I remind in March uh, 2020, one colleague from Brazil made me a chat, uh, say me, please let me know something about online because I have to go tomorrow in online and I don't know how to do it. I have no the issues there. My, my first answers to the people in the next two months from March to May 2020 was, Try to go flip it. Try to go to tour. You are not a teacher now. You are a tutor. Try to learn students how to learn because this is the way that we try to do it in distance and online education. It's the only way you can manage the people in online if you like to be effective and you like to really have the knowledge transmitted to the students there. And this is the good thing there. Now that a lot of teachers in the face-to-face -face know this kind of, of tools. They have some in some cases big and some cases small uh, tools from the university for the universities, the uses for the online, and now probably they will have a lot of new 
techniques and a lot of new activities they will do in the face-to-face -face activities. They will do it there. I believe the typical one-hour uh, academic uh, class will go out probably in some specific places with some invited people probably will do. But we put away these kind of things in the Bologna process. In Bologna process in Europe, we put away these kind of things. But a lot of people continue doing there. But I believe the pandemic will for sure change this because we don't know when we have to go back to the old time there. Yeah, definitely. We do not know when we will be able to go back or if yes. we are going to be able to But go. I believe it's good to go back to the university. Yeah. Yeah. I completely agree with this. Okay, the last two questions are related to smart education ecosystem. The first one is which is the role of the educator? And the second one is the what important development do you expect in the near, near future for the smart education ecosystem? So role of the educator and future. The role, I, the role of the educator, I believe, we will continue as a tutor. This is a real role of the educator we have in, in online and distance and in smart university. We are really the person, we are the driver of the bus of the education. The driver decides the route and the driver decided. Today and 10 years ago, we are drivers that we only have a map, a real map, a face-to-face -face map. But now we have internet, we have Google, and we have Google Maps. They changed completely the way of the driving. I don't know if you remind the time you have to go. I remind 20 years ago when I go to United States, I need one month to prepare one, one, one trip or one week because we never, we never know what we'll expect in any city you will go or any uh, state you will go. Now you can go to United States. Now, no, two years ago, you can go to United States from one day to one minute without touching nothing because you are aware of you have the Google Maps that you, they will help you and support you in any moment. This is the difference for the bus driver. We are the bus driver of the education We have to select the tutoring path. We have to select the things there. We have to use the artificial intelligence, analytics, and all the things. If our platform that should be Moodle, Canvas, any one platform you have, if you see the platform of Blackboard and so on there, if you see that your platform is sending you a message that some student is going out, then you have to move there and try to engage them again and try to put inside it or the platform can do it automatically for you, depending on the, the level of the platform. But this is the real future there. But you are the driver. I not believe in the self-education driving environment. We are, as you know, we are going now to, to automatic driving cars, automatic driving things there. Future will be in this direction, of course. And a lot of new tools we are start to have in decisions in the education environment. This is the future. This is the second part of the answer. The future will have a lot of new systems taking decisions for the education for us. But I believe we will remain our seats and our positions for so many years and for some decade there. We need to be in the systems. Artificial intelligence is changing the world, of course. They will change all the environments of the world. But this is not the final solution of the world. This is another tool, another technological tool there and the future will be completely undefined. We don't know the future will be. Probably will be completely different as we can imagine today. Yes, lots of, lots of challenges in front of us. Defi definitely difficult to, to have clear predictions, uh, insights, uh, what's going to be. Maybe uh, there will be the, the robots who will be the drivers and we will be the passengers directing them where to drive us. So, well, let's, let's see what the future brings. Um, I wish to thank you, Manuel, for a very, very good presentation, uh, giving us lots of thoughts uh, uh, to think about and to actually see how vulnerable we are all uh, in, in taking uh, uh, something uh, 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 as it is. You know, now, today, we have to reflect on everything uh, uh, we do because uh, as a future, we can say is unpredictable, but also we can look at it in a positive way that why should we know what's going future will bring? Uh, it's always good to to wait and hope for something uh, better. Uh, I will now conclude our plenary for to today, for this morning. 
Uh, I hope you all enjoyed. Uh, I invite you to have a coffee break and after that to join to numbers of presentation and workshops we have prepared for today. And at six o'clock, we will have the uh, scholarly gala where we will award uh, best research paper, paper award. So stay with us. I would like to thank my speakers, Georgi and Manuel, for being with us uh, today and have a good, fruitful uh, day at the conference uh, today. Thank you. Bye.